Hi everyone and welcome to today's video on measures of spread. Now, cracking an old joke because if you've seen the discrete random variables video, I do exactly the same joke. So it is not Marmite or Vegemite or that type of spread. It is spread of data. So it probably wasn't as funny the second time. If in fact it was funny the first time. This is measures of spread though for continuous random variables. Should probably add that to the title. Anyway, what are we hoping to do by the end of the lesson? Well, in previous videos, we've dealt with continuous random variables, what they are. We've dealt with the mean and the median and percentiles for continuous random variables. And so I suppose spread is talking about variance and standard deviation. We've done that with discrete random variables, remember? And luckily, if you've understood it for discrete, you should also be able to understand it for continuous. So as I say here, yeah, we're going to look at what is meant by variance and standard deviation and how to find the variance and the standard deviation of a continuous distribution. Right. As we say, the recap about statistics is because we've already done this in, in um, discrete random variables, then I don't need to go too deeply into what the actual meaning of variance and standard deviation is. Other than say that variance is effectively um, a measure of a distance away from the mean line of each of our data points, right? So if you sort of remember, they were positives and negatives, and we squared them to make them all positives, and then sort of took some sort of an average to work out uh, how far away from the mean line it was. We then had to square root it to go back to our standard deviation. Do you understand that? No? Then go and watch that video. It's fabulous. But the recap uh, sort of leads on to the idea that if we look at the variance and standard deviation for discrete random variables, the theory is very much the same. So we knew that from that video, and in fact our last video, that to find the expectation of a discrete random variable, we use the idea of the sum 2x of x times the PR of x equals x, which could also be written as, oh, my E was not a good one there. E is a good, E is a good, Urban E is a good. Uh, x times the P of x. So that was from my previous lesson and discrete random variables. And then we went on to say, well, working out our variance could be done in two different ways. I thought of this as the complicated way. Don't like it at all, all right? That's where you have the table and you sort of take away mu from all of the values or this one here, which is actually the one that we used. So the idea was that the variance of x was given by the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x all squared. Now, just to recap, do you remember that when we wanted to find the expectation of x squared, we did the sum again to x of x squared times the p of x. So we added that extra table in, whereas we normally would have had x and p of x, we added that table in, so we did the x squared. And then because we did the sum of all the values, we just multiplied this value by this value, this value by this value. That, va that sort of row there effectively disappeared. The same theory is actually going to hold true. How do we find the standard deviation? Well, if you remember, with the variance, we were squaring all of our distances away from the mean. And so to turn it back into the original units, we need to square root the variance. Right. So how does that apply to uh, continuous random variables? Well, exactly the same. We knew that the mean from our previous video of a continuous random variable is given by the integral. All right, and if we remember about the integral sign, what does it do? It sums all of the areas under for a PDF. And remember, for a PDF, the air, all the um, the area underneath has to be equal to one, so that our sum of our probabilities can be no more than one. So we said that the e of x for a continuous random variable is equal to minus infinity or a and b of x times whatever my function of x was dx. That gives me my expected value. And because the variance remains exactly the same, so the variance is calculated by the e of x squared minus e of x or squared, I've already got the e of x, so thank you very much. I've already got that value there. I can square it. How do I find the e of x squared for, oops, no, put that inside the brackets, Darren x squared, how do we do that for a continuous random variable? Well, the same way. So it's the integral between minus infinity and infinity, or whatever our limits are, of x squared times the function of x dx. And it really is actually that simple. And I've sort of put it there. So for those of you who want to take a screen grab or download PDF notes, which I'll upload shortly, that's effectively all the hard work done for you. So the variance is the same, same formula. The standard deviation, well, as I say here, the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the variance of x. So mean x times the function of x integral between a and b, e of x squared, x squared times the function x times dx. So here is an example to sort of put all this into place. 
And it's pretty much the example we used from our last video. So we've got the function of x is given by 0.5x between 0 and 2. Now remember, we've got to make sure that whenever we have a probability density function, the area underneath adds up only to 1. Everything outside of those limits, so the lowest is 0 and the highest is 2, everything outside of those limits has to have an x value of 0, all the way to infinity and minus infinity. Done a little bit of that on a previous lesson, but let's, let's not get too carried away now. So what do we want to do? We want to find the variance. So the variance of x is given by e of x squared minus bracket e of x all squared. So let's work out what the e... Actually, let's do it over here. Let's work out what the e of x squared is going to be. And I'm going to use my calculator to help me do this. So on the integral between the limits of 0 and 2 of x squared times my function of x, which is a half of x dx. All right, so what do we want to do? We want to go keyboard, um, math 2. So we want to find between 2 and 0 our function, which is x squared times... 0.5x dx. Hit enter, and beautifully it comes out as 2. So we know e of x squared is now 2. What do I work out next? Well, I need to work out the e of x, because then I'm going to square that value. So the e of x, same thing between 0 and 2, but this time is going to be x times a half of x dx. Hit equals. Now the great thing is, bringing my calculator back, I've already got the hard work there. So just to sort of make it simpler, I'm going to copy and paste, and this time I'm going to get rid of the x squared and just turn that to x times 0.5 of x dx between my limits of 0 and 2, which gives me 4 on 3. Also good, because that's what it was in my last video. So though that really is the hard work done. How do I now find my variance of x? Right, well, just plonk it into the formula. So e of x squared was 2 minus 4 on 3 all squared. So again, I'm going to do my calculator. So 2, so highlight and drag it down, although it's not working particularly well. Let's just type 2 minus, open brackets, let's drag all of that, close the brackets and square it gives me the grand total of 0.22231. Now, do you notice the 0 0.31 there? Why do you think that is? It's not really what I was expecting. And it's because I've dragged and dropped that 1.33333. So actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go 2 minus. I know 1 over uh, 1.333 is actually 4 on 3. So I'm going to do 4 on 3, close my brackets, and I'm going to square it. And we get 0 0.222, which, if I put my calculator back into standard mode rather than decimal mode, will give me two nines. So my variance works out to be 2 on 9. Having got my variance, it then says find my standard deviation. And we know the standard deviation of x is given by the square root of the variance of x, which gives me the square root of 2 on 9. Now, a point here about notation. What I've just written there would actually lose me marks in a VCAR exam, VC exam. And if you don't know what a VCAR exam, it's an Australian exam. The reason being is because your square root sign does not go over the two nines. This is a top tip. You really should do a graphic for a top tip. The square root sign has to go all the way over and enclose what it is you're trying to square root. So square root of root two of two on nine is going to give me root two on three. And ladies and gentlemen, there is my standard deviation. We've already done this sort of theory in a previous lesson, but it's now just got to remember that we use the integration sign and x or x squared to find this out. Now, how is this ever going to be useful to me? Well, we're going to fast forward to the, when we use the mean and the standard deviation. And towards the end of the section or the chapter, uh, or in fact, the textbook that we're dealing in, the Cambridge textbook, we're going to start dealing with sample sizes and means and, and confidence intervals and all sorts of stuff. And a lot of this is going to be really important to us. So... As I say, later in the chapter and book, we're going to use the mean and standard deviation to lots, answer lots of questions. Obviously, it's a maths course. We've come across this notation before. Well, we're trying to find the probability of mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma. So what we're trying to say here is find the probability that uh, a random variable x falls between two standard deviations of my mean. If you remember, mu, mu stands for mean, and sigma stands for my standard deviation. And why is this going to be important to us? Well, when we get to bell curves and all this type of stuff, and those of you who are doing further maths over here in Australia, you've gone at this type of stuff now. We'll know what this graph actually means. And so 
we'll be looking at the percentages of the data that fit between minus two standard deviations and two standard deviations of my mean. I don't want to get too deep into this, but it all comes in really, really important. And let's finish off with a question or two. If we know that the mean is standard deviation, we can use them to answer the following type of questions. The life of a certain brand of battery X hours is a continuous random variable. That's very kind of them to give me that. Thank you very much. Continuous random variable. Thank you very much. With a mean of 50. So we've got mu equals 50 and a variance of 16. Now, do you notice they've given me the variance there is 16. So I'm actually automatically going to write down that my standard deviation of X must be equal to 4. It's very rare that I'm given the variance. It's always the standard deviation. Find an approximate interval for the time period for which 95% of the batteries would be expected to last. Now actually that does require us to go back to here because what we know about this bell curve and our standard deviations is something called the 68, 95 and 99.7% rule which in the later video funnily enough I call the Smith rule but that's a, a whole new discussion. So what it's saying is is that 68% of my data falls between one standard deviation 95% of the data fit, falls between two standard deviations and approximately 99.7% lies between three standard deviations. So what we're basically saying is find two standard deviations away from the mean. So we want mu plus two sigma and mu minus two sigma, although those are going to be the other way around. So let's have a look. Mu we know is 50 plus two lots of sigma is two lots of four and we've got 50 minus two lots of four, which gives us 58. And take away that, 42. So if we wanted an approximate interval for the time period of which 95% of the batteries, our time period would be in brackets 42 to 58. And I'm assuming that would be hours. All right, so that's just a very basic example of how to do this. One last measure of spread we use is the interquartile range. And you've met this in year 10. And we're going to throw it in now like a ball into a basketball hoop. And no, I am no good at basketball whatsoever. Although I'm strangely going to be a basketball coach or a member of staff. Go figure. It's where approximately 50% of the data lies. Uh, the best way I can show this was using a box plot. Now, if you remember what a box plot is, it's effectively something that has what we call our lowest value or our lowest point, our highest value, our lower quartile, median and our upper quartile. So we can split our data into effectively five pieces. And in further, this is called the five point summary, where we have the lowest point, the lower quartile, median, the upper quartile, and the highest point. But the point of this is when we've got five data items, there are four gaps. And those four gaps basically mean that we can split our data into quartiles. So wherever we see 25%, we have what we call a quartile. And the language of the interquartile range basically says, find the difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. Well, the upper quartile is also known as the 75th percentile. If you've watched my previous video, you know what a percentile is. And this one is, strangely enough, my 25th percentile. Thank you all very much. So using that information, we can now find interquartile ranges for cumulative, cumulative, for continuous data. So here we go. Here's an example. Determine the interquartile range of the random variable x, which has the probability density function. So again, thank you very much. Probability density function means the area under that curve is going to be 1. So I can use all the theorem I'm about to do. It's a hybrid function. So it's going to be continuous data. And what is it we want to do? The probability density function. So to do that, we are going to find our 25th percentile. So we're going to integrate between 0 and we're going to call it a because we don't know what this value is. So whatever this 2x is, here is 2x. That's roughly speaking nothing like the value of 2x because it should really have gone through here. But just put it down to my bad drawing. So we're going between the 0 and 1. So let's imagine that's the end and it's uh, 0 at all other places. So I'm going to draw a line there and a line there. OK, right. So we need to try and find the 25th percentile and we'll call that a and my 75th percentile, which we'll call B in this situation. So our 25th percentile says, we know that this here has to be 25% of my data. So it's the integral between 0 and A of my function of x, dx, is equal to 0 0.25. So I'm going to integrate between 0 and A. What is my function? It's just 2x, dx, is equal to 0 0.25. Loading up my trusty calculator and clearing this screen down so that we can see it all in one thing. 
All right, we want it solve because we're trying to find that value of a solve. Nope, didn't hit solve. Try that one again. Solve the integral between zero and let's go to a of my function, which is 2x dx dx. Where are you? And then equals 0.25. And we want to do a comma because we're solving for the value of a close my brackets. Once there we get minus a half and a half. Now I'm going to just put those into decimals uh, just to make life a little bit easier for me for the moment. So minus 0.5 and 0.5, you know that one of those values isn't possible. Why? Because we know that this function is only defined between values of x of between 0 and 1. Although it says a equals, these are actually values of x. So we now know my a value for that is going to be 0 0.5. Thank you very much. So I know a. So we're now going to do it for our 75th percentile. So here is my 75th percentile and we're going to go between now don't get confused it's actually now all of this data that we want so 75 percent so we're looking for 75 percent from zero up to my value of b so i'm going to change zero to b and we don't need to do f of x again because we know it's 2x dx but in this case it's 0 0.75 loading up my calculator as we did last time i'm going to copy this because I'm just going to change a couple of numbers. Let's change A to B. I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't need to. Let's change that one to B. And let's change that to 0.75. Come on, calculator. So between 0 and B, 2x dx, press equals, and out comes those values there. So minus 0 0.866, and automatically my brain's going, well, it can't be negative, because once again, my function is only defined between 0 and 1. And this other value here of 0 0.866. So I get my A value of 0 0.866025. Da, 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 da. Is that my final answer? Eh, eh. Why? Because they wanted my interquartile range. And I now know that my interquartile range is given by the upper quartile minus by my lower quartile, which in the language we're using is the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile which gives me 0 0.866025 dot, 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 minus 0 0.5. I'm firing up my calculator, even though I could do this in my head. I'm gonna do 0 0.866025 minus 0 0.5, and that's gonna give me invalid syntax. Why is that the case? 0 0.866025 minus 0 0.5 gives me 0 0.36625. And I would round that to a sufficient level of accuracy. Not that it gives me one here at this moment in time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what have we done today? We have skipped merrily through uh, measures were spread for continuous random variables. Great thing was it built on the stuff we did in discrete random variables. We've looked at the formulas, we can find out percentiles, we know what the standard deviation is and the variance. It has, as ever, been awesome seeing you in this video. Have you subscribed yet? No? Then do me a favor, subscribe by doing that circle there. And do me a favor as well, get out there and tell your friends. No? All right, maybe next time. If not, there's a video there loading for you to watch. Have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video.